so much for joining us online this morning. My name is Kelly. And my name is Dino, and it is our great privilege to welcome you to Church Online today. We are the lead pastors here at Free Church Tiger Book Hills, and we just want to thank you once again for being with us on this Sunday morning. If this is your first time joining us here today, we want to say church is better because you're in it and you're the reason why we do it. We really pray that the service would bless you and equip you. Right now, one of our hosts is going to post a connect card link that you can just click on that link and this will help us serve you better. And so if this is your first time, give us a thumbs up, let us know, click that link and we can serve you a whole lot better that way. You can also send a message to our WhatsApp number and we will send connect cards to you or any other information that you may need. We Brilliant. just want you to know that we have not forgotten about our kids in this time. We have an amazing Kids Church program that takes place on our website. Once again, if you're watching one of our live time services on Facebook Premier or on Church Online, you will see that someone will uh, send a link right now to our Kids Church page on our website. There are videos, there are songs, there's activities for you to print to do with them. And uh, we even have suggestions for crafts so you can do at home on our Pinterest page. So we're really trying our best to make sure that they'll continue to be discipled in this time. Yeah, don't miss out. Don't miss out on this opportunity to disciple yeah. your young people. We absolutely believe in the next generation. And we are so passionate about equipping people. Talking about equipping people, we are really excited about something called Growth Track. Growth Track is the front door to our church. The reason why we're passionate about Growth Track is because it's a conversation that we enter into to discover your design. And we say when you discover your design, it reveals your destiny. And so we want to encourage you the first Sunday, first week of every month, uh, we launch Growth Track. And you can sign up for Growth Track today. Let us know that you're going to be joining us. We can prepare to host you better. And so we'll let you know exactly how to get onto that link. Otherwise, you can just send us your details, DM us, you can email us, you can WhatsApp us, and we'll make sure that we are prepared to host you for Growth Track. I'm so excited about yeah, it. We're so excited to share about it and excited to have you join us. You might be wondering, well, what do we do in Growth Track? So, in Growth Track, you'll really understand uh, who View Church Tiger Big Hills is. You'll hear a word from Dina and I about the history of our church, where do we come from, what are our core beliefs, what is our culture, and uh, what would it look like for you to be part of our family and on our team. Uh, you'll then, uh, the second week, you do a gifts assessment to see, you know, well, if you are going to be involved and you're going to serve and, and you don't know how, uh, what are some of the gifts that God has already given you? And then lastly, you have an opportunity to connect and just become part of the family. So it's a, it's a simple three-step process. Um, it's not scary. You're going to enjoy it and you're really going to understand the family that you have become a part of. Yeah, we always say choose joy. We always love having fun and you're going to love Growth Track. Well, we have some exciting news to share uh, what's happening in the life in and through the life of our church. And uh, some of those praise reports are so important. Revelations 12 verse 11 tells us that we overcome him, the enemy of our souls, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so it's so powerful when we share what God has done in and through our lives. And so we just want to share three quick praise reports with you to prepare your heart, to let your faith grow and know that our oh, God is good. The first praise report is that someone's rent has been wavered. They've been given a grace period during this time. And so that's just absolutely amazing. After praying that God would come through financially, their landlord said that they have a grace period in rents. Give God a big amen and thank you, Jesus, for that. We also want to praise God for healing that um, all the cancer was removed after we prayed as a church we were praying for a particular person they removed all the cancer there's no traces left and we just thank God that he is our ultimate healer and the great physician the last praise report that we want to share with you today is an incredible one it's someone who had lost their job and I know there are so many people in this time that are going through something similar and uh, they had lost their job but the very next week after they lost their job they have received an interview and they're waiting to hear back i think that's a praise report in waiting and so we want to thank god that he is jehovah jireh our provider he takes care of us in light of how good god is and the same god that answered those prayers is the same god that hears your prayers and hears your praises come on let's pull ourselves together let's get energized let's get focused let's engage right now in worship as we give god the praise he deserves
I'll follow where your spirit leads Broken as my life may be I will give you every peace I hear you Less of me and more of you I just want to see
or we can continue to worship God today through the giving of our finances. If this is your first time with us this morning, please, we want nothing from you. In fact, we believe this service is a gift to you. and We pray the service has been a blessing. However, if this is your spiritual home and you know God has called you to be with us as View Church Tigerberg Hills, we are now going to continue to worship God through the giving of our finances. We believe that the tenth, the first 10% of our income belongs to the Lord. We call it the tithe. And anything over above that is called an offering. And as we grow in generosity, the Bible says the world of the generous becomes bigger and bigger. The scripture I want to share with you today has very little to do with finance. In fact, nothing, but everything to do with worship. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 4. It says, Hear, come on everyone, listen up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. goes on to say, talk about it all the time. Talk about the Lord when you come and when you go, when you stand, when you sit. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. I believe every day is an opportunity to fall more in love with Jesus, fall more in love with God, and express our love to Him. And so today, may you take your next step in showing God, expressing your love for Jesus through your time, your talent, and your treasure. You'll see right now there's a snap scan code that's come up or the link below me to give online. It's the best way to give in this season and time. But I just want to honor you and thank you. Our church has really stepped up. The world is crying for hope and for help. And our church has stepped up to the plate and said, we will be Jesus' hands and feet. So I want to thank every single person who continues to grow in obedience and generosity in the season and this time. We love you and honor you. I also want to encourage you right now to open up your hearts and our minds. We have our founding pastor, Graham Evans, with us today, sharing the powerful word. So open up your minds, open up your notebooks as we receive the word of God today. Hi, guys. I just want to uh, welcome all the Tigers. I really miss you guys. You are the best. And I uh, hope you really can enjoy our time together. I've entitled my message, Sharpening Your Tools, in the series on Digging Ditches. And uh, there's one main scripture I'm going to read. It's my theme scripture. 2 Kings 3.16 And he said, Thus says the Lord, Make this valley full of of ditches. Now, let's be honest, it makes a lot of sense. Um, they were trapped in the desert, there was no water for them and their animals, and if God was to send water, it would need to be contained in a ditch so that they and the animals could drink it, and obviously they could draw water for storage. But digging a ditch is a lot of work. I don't know if any of you dug a ditch. Um, I remember the very first swimming pool uh, that we built. I didn't have a lot of money. I had cashed in an insurance. And uh, I personally dug the pool out. And what I discovered when I started digging was that our house was built on an old rubbish dump. And of course, every level of digging, I found a different layer of rubbish. So that was quite an experience. Um, so really, what we're going to be talking about today is the tools that we might use to dig. And uh, if you look at the definition of a tool, um, it has a broader and more narrow definition. The narrow definition is really something that you would hold in your hand to perform a task or a function. So it could be garden clippers, uh, it could be a screwdriver, you name it, um, power tools. But then, of course, there is a broader definition today of tools. It's essentially anything that you and I could use that will help us to perform an operation. So it could very well be um, your computer, your smartphone, um, your wisdom, your college degree, um, anything that will help you. Let me just put the clippers down. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the concept of a toolbox. There will be a picture of a really great toolbox coming up. But I've also brought my late, Jenny's late stepfather's uh, toolbox. And uh, this contains anything and everything that you might use. And yes, what I'm going to be really discussing is tools that you might need for your family, your work situation, or your personal life. 
So let's get on. I'm going to briefly summarize what happened to the three kings and their armies that actually got them to be frantically digging ditches in a rocky desert. Um, simply, um, the king of Israel had a beef with the king of Moab. He decided he was going to war. And all in a rush, he gathered together the kings of, Ju um, of Judah and Edom. I don't know whether he sent them a WhatsApp message or whether he scoffed or had a Zoom call. But anyway, they went into battle mode or began a journey without any preparation, without the correct equipment and without an intelligence briefing. And they made a bad decision. They decided to go through the desert instead of around the desert. And they'd marched for seven days and reached a point where they were completely exhausted and were dying of thirst. So there we are. No obvious solution. And our story is found in 2 Kings 3, 9 to 20. Um, the scripture may come up, but I'm just going to briefly summarize what's in the passage is that they asked themselves the question, is there a man of God? Uh, and um, because obviously they needed to connect with God. And then one of the um, army officers in the Israel army said that Elisha was there. And they, of course, immediately went to Elisha. They knew he was a prophet. And uh, he was actually quite rude to the king of Israel and said, you know what, if it wasn't for the fact that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was here, I would actually not even see you. And, um, and then what he said to them was in verse 15, but now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus said the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And then this is one of my favorite scriptures ever. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. What a statement. This is a simple matter. I can just produce water whenever I want to. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand, uh, and also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree. Verse 20, Now it happened in the morning after the grain offering was offered that suddenly the water came by the way of Edom and the land was filled with water. I want to start off by looking at our response to crises. Because let's be honest, we're all to some extent in a crisis with the whole COVID-19 scenario. Uh, many people have lost jobs. Their businesses aren't doing well. Um, some people have got the virus. And, uh, and no one is really sure what's going to happen. The first thing I think is guilt. It's kind of reflective. Even if you don't admit it to somebody, you're thinking, maybe I should have prepared better. Maybe I should have foreseen this. I don't know about you, but you think, wow. I should have reduced my, my bond or, or, or maybe my credit cards are too high. Um, that kind of thing. And I think the king of Israel would have felt guilty. Um, he had rushed into this scenario. Um, he certainly hadn't asked God what he should do. And I think if we don't deal with guilt in a healthy way, we go to the next step and that's blame. We start the blame game. And look, his guilt was simple. He said, you know what? I just believe God has delivered us into the hands of Moab because he knew he wasn't right with God. But the blame game, I have never in my life seen so much blaming as is going on at the moment over the source of coronavirus and what should have been done and what wasn't done. But can I tell you this? You will never get to a godly solution while you are indulging in blame. And... Uh, of course, again, the king of Israel said, well, you know, I didn't consult any prophets because God has delivered us into the hands of the king of Moab. It's so sad how many people blame God. And can I tell you something? I've heard a lot of people blame God for the coronavirus. 
But you go to the book of Leviticus. I know that's not a popular book in the Bible. I think it's chapter 11. Actually sets out animals and birds that are unclean to eat. And I want to say this. God's not to blame for people who eat bats and civets. Um, yeah. Let's not blame God for that. Uh, okay, so what's the third response? We've got guilt, we've got blame. The third response, in fact, the only valid response, is for us to turn to our toolbox, to find the tools that would enable us to extricate ourselves from the crisis. That makes sense to you guys? But you know, when you lose hope, you don't even open the toolbox because you actually believe it's empty or you don't believe the tools in the toolbox will get you out of the jam that you're in. And I believe it takes a lot of courage to say, you know what, I'm going to find the tools that will take us to victory. Amen. And, uh, you know, we Capetonians, we're tough. We've, we've uh, been through load shedding, day zero, and now coronavirus. You guys with me? We are going to come through this crisis in the victory that God has promised us. So, okay, you now have to open the toolbox if you want to firstly survive and secondly thrive. And you've got to examine your tools. Because firstly, you need the right tools. And when you've got the right tools, you need to sharpen them. Okay, it's no good using the wrong tools. I want to tell you something that this screwdriver can never dig a ditch. Uh, right? What do we need? We need a shovel to dig a ditch. So I think you guys are getting where I'm going with our message. And it's so interesting because in the COVID situation, so many of the tools that we been used to and are not there. Having plenty of money, having a bank balance, uh, having a secure job, um, maybe a business that's doing well, um, that job security, um, even physical contact with people. It's not there anymore. Maybe you've been accustomed to that. And, um, and let, me, let me put it this way, alcohol and cigarettes. How many people need alcohol and cigarettes to calm them so that they can do their job? All of that's been taken away. What about Jim? I must say, it took me quite a while to get used to the fact that I can't go to gym five days a week. Shame. So, you examine the tools. You may find that the tools you have are not the right tools. And I want to suggest that it's a time to search for old tools. Maybe the tool that's hidden away in the dark corner of your garage. I had quite a bit of fun. I went into my garage and right next to the door, there's a, a cabinet. And between the two, there's a small dark space. And uh, I found this somewhat rusty spade. And let me tell you, this was a magnet for spider webs. Uh, took about five minutes to get the spider webs away. And I also found a chopper. Now, I'm not sure if this is the chopper I used in Durban, which really is kind of 30 years ago. But it hasn't been used, and neither has the spade. I'm wondering whether you're in the position that you need to go back and find the old tools. Um, example, prayer. Maybe God's people. I don't know. Perhaps it's been a long time since you've been close to God. And uh, going back to our story, uh, the king of Israel um, realized that there was only one answer to their predicament, and that was to connect with God. But sadly, he didn't have a connection with God. So they went and searched for a prophet. You know what I love about the story of Elisha? He just kind of quietly joined the army. The king didn't know he was there. I think he kind of got his rucksack out, put some spare underpants and T-shirts in, maybe a couple of tins of tuna, and, uh, and off he went. And that's what I believe a man of God is. He's a man who anticipates and positions himself to be used by God. And I think this has been a wonderful opportunity for our churches 
to, to actually help those who don't have food. Amen. So, yeah, there's old Elisha. Uh, he was just minding his own business in the middle of the army. And, uh, and so there we are. Um, he was quite rude to the king of Israel, but he was only prepared to consult God because he was a godly man, Jehoshaphat. And some of you might be in a family situation where you think you're the only person who really loves God or is searching for God. Can I tell you, God will honor the fact that you are connecting with him. And he will indeed save your whole family. Because this is what happened. Because Jehoshaphat and Elisha were there, victory was in their future. So, okay. Then what happened was, if you remember the story, Elisha asked for a musician. And I want to tell you that when you need a spiritual tool, worship music brings the presence of God. Um, I don't know what the harpist played. I'm sure it would have been a, a well-known hymn or psalm. And uh, the presence of God just came. And in the presence of God, God spoke. And uh, I want to encourage you, guys, when the service starts, participate in the worship. Uh, get out your worship music. Uh, if you don't have worship music, download it. And it doesn't matter what your preference is. Find music that brings the presence of God. Because I want you to know, in that environment, you will hear God speak to you. Then, this is, this is quite interesting. There's a secret tool that was used. The secret tool that no one understands is obedience that arises out of submission to God. Let's be honest. If you talk about obedience and submission, you're called uh, a fanatic, you're called a freak, whatever. Because obedience and submission is not popular in our world, but it is a secret weapon. And uh, it was so tragically because Saul was the first king of Israel. And um, every time God gave him an instruction, he did it his own way. And eventually God removed the kingship from him. And this is what the prophet Samuel said to him. I'm reading from 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. In our context, your service in the church your involvement in the church. God values obedience. And let's be honest, um, these three kings made a crazy decision to dig the ditches. I mean, that was the same, really, I think, as um, building an ark when it never rained before or trying to feed 15,000 people with five rolls and two fish. I tell you what, it took a lot of courage to tell every soldier if you dig a ditch, God's going to fill it. But you know, it was their obedience that brought the victory. So there we are, looking for old tools, connecting with God, worship and obedience. And um, yeah, it must have been crazy digging ditches in the desert. Look, I've only been in the desert a couple of times. I was in Masada in Israel. I was at Las Vegas, by the way, for a Christian conference. Uh, and I want to tell you, the heat was insane. And I've got a picture there of a rocky desert. I want to tell you, in the daytime, that's 40 plus. Okay, so let's get down to my last point. It's about sharpening spades. And I've got a picture that's going to come up of Americans training for World War I. And their training consisted um, of learning how to dig a ditch. In the First World War, I think there were thousands of kilometers of trenches or ditches right across Europe. And I'm absolutely sure that they used sharp spades. Now, if we go back to our three kings, I don't know what instruments they used. Um, I'm quite sure a lot of them weren't sharp. Um, let me tell you this, during lockdown, um, I took the opportunity to do some uh, spring cleaning. Um, 
my my slogan was one draw or one uh one cupboard a day and uh, i must be honest i did find letters and invoices going back to 2010 but i also got back into my garden and uh, i was cutting some trees that were hanging over the electric fence and managed to electrocute myself twice i didn't know that electricity goes through through wood anyway be that as it may um but let me tell you what i realized that most instruments in my house were blunt um including a lot of the knives and it's quite frustrating um because the scripture in Ecclesiastes 10 is so accurate. I'm going to read it to you. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. What's the wisdom? The wisdom is to keep your tools sharp. And I want to just talk about wisdom. Wisdom tells us what to sharpen and when to sharpen. So wisdom is an amazing tool. Now, natural wisdom is all the knowledge we accumulate through our intelligence, our training, its reasoning, its logic, its creativity, but everything about ourselves. But let me say this, spiritual wisdom starts where natural wisdom ends. And all of natural wisdom was not able to help these three armies who were dying of thirst in the desert. And I want to encourage you, if your natural wisdom has ended, please, why don't you ask for God's wisdom? It comes out of all of God's knowledge of the present, past, and future, His planning, His purposes, His righteousness, His holiness. And I think this might be a moment where we actually recognize that wisdom is a tool. Amen. So let's move on to the season the season is to sharpen our spiritual tools. And uh, I honestly believe that when we make wis wise decisions, we will see the success. Because when, when they got wisdom from God and when they were obedient, all the water that they need suddenly appeared. So I'm just going to close by looking at one tool. And this is the most powerful tool ever. This tool is the Word of God. And I can hear people saying amen out there. But I wonder, do you have a whole lot of Bibles at home? They're on shelves, they're in bookcases. Uh, maybe you've got the Bible on your computer. But have you sharpened that tool? Um, and I'm just going to give you a few ways in which you can sharpen the tool. And it starts with acknowledging and proclaiming the high value of scripture yes scripture contained in the holy bible is by far the most valuable tool that you will ever use um, it's actually god's revelation to mankind and um, in fact it is the only authentic written record of god's disclosure to mankind the only authentic written record and what the scripture contains is all of God's truth, all the truth that you and I need for life. Um, and of course, the amazing thing about scripture is that we believe that it is absolute and unchanging. His truth never changes. So uh, we need to raise our value of scripture. And let's be honest, everything in the Old Testament leads to Jesus Christ, his teaching, his life, and then his death and resurrection. The blood of Jesus is the way in which you and I receive forgiveness for sins. Uh, when we confess our sins, we have eternal life. We become sons and daughters of God. We become heirs uh, together with Christ. And I believe that every single day, when we value God's word, we always value the cross and Jesus Christ. And in Romans 1 verse 16, it's going to come up. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. How awesome would it be if every morning we confirm our salvation, we ask God to forgive us of our sins, we make right with Him, we pray for others, 
and uh, it's almost like breaking of bread. Um, you could have that in the morning. I've got a great photograph of Jesus on the cross. And then in that regard to the value of Scripture, Scripture is the light in both the natural and spiritual darkness and will always direct us in our daily actions. And I've got a, a lovely uh, photograph of a man in darkness. And here's the word, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Okay, so can I suggest something that you could repeat every day? I'm going to read it, but even though I've started doing it um, every day. I believe that the Holy Scriptures are inspired by God, contain no error, and have absolute authority in my life. The Bible contains all the truth that I will ever need for life. The Bible contains all the truth that I will ever need for life. Can I say this, that when, when we raise the value of Scripture, immediately we will go to the next step, which is to meditate on the Word of God. And what happens when we meditate? The Holy Spirit illuminates truth. And there are always three Scriptures. It's not a big thing. What does it tell me about God? What does it tell me about us? And what does God want me to do now? What application do I need to make now? I want to tell you, it will change your life. You only need to read one verse or one passage. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate, immediately the treasure of God's Word will be revealed. And Psalm 1, I'm going to read verse 2 to 3. It's the, the cornerstone of the Psalms. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit in every season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. So we value the scripture, we meditate, then commit to memory. Listen, that is an old tool. Nobody remembers anything anymore because we live in an avalanche of knowledge. I mean, I used to know people's phone numbers. Now I just get the phone number on my phone. Of course, I know my wife's phone number. Whew, that's important. Um, it's so interesting how God commands us he instructs us to remember his word and before the israelites went into the promised land we read in the book of deuteronomy god said to them and i'm going to read from verse 11 sorry verse 18 of chapter 11 so commit yourself wholeheartedly to these words of mine tie them to your hands wear them on your forehead as reminders i presume that's a headband um Write them on doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish. Prosperity, flourishing comes when we value the Word of God, when we meditate on it and we remember it. Lastly, this is my last point. When you value, meditate and memorize, you confess God's word. Confessing the word of God verbally. In other words, we declare or proclaim eternal truth. Now there's a great scripture in Proverbs 18.21. Most of us know it. The tongue has the power of life and death. I think we Christians forget the power of the tongue. We don't realize that it will bring life or it will bring, de bring death. And I think back to the 12 spies in Canaan. They were great leaders. And when they went into the promised land, they saw amazing things and they saw the problems that would arise from giants and, and very thick walls around cities. The mistake they made was to not firstly confess the good things. In their minds, they were worried. The 10 spies, that is. Um, only Joshua and Caleb confess God's word, the truth, then what happened was the thoughts in their mind became the words on their lips when they gave a report. And unfortunately, those words developed a life of their own. They were worried and they confessed the worry. It ended up by them saying the people will devour us and we're grasshoppers. It didn't end there the whole nation of Israel began to weep and wail. They began to blame God and they wanted to kill Moses. 
And the long-term result was each and every one of them died in the desert, except for Caleb and Joshua. Guys, we can't afford in coronavirus to keep making negative confessions. So what do we do? We change our confession. You know, the first thing we do when you change our confession is we confess the sin of unclean lips. I always think of Isaiah, right early on in his ministry, read it in Isaiah chapter 6. He had a vision of God. And what the vision of God led him to do was to cry out, Woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. In other words, the things that have come out of my mouth, the negativity that I have been expressing about the new king and about the way things are going. That negative confession has hurt God. It's a sin before God. And it was a, once he did that, the angel came and put a, a, a tongue of fire on his lips and he was forgiven. And immediately God gave him his ministry. So, Guys, when you and I allow the confession of our lips to proceed, it aligns our confession with our minds and our hearts. There's always an alignment of the mind and the heart. If it's negative, it's going to have a negative life. But if it's positive, your faith is going to grow and a miracle is possible. And how the story ends, it's incredible. I believe that those three kings must have proclaimed to all those disgruntled soldiers that God has spoken. God has spoken through Elisha and He has instructed us to dig ditches that will, that will contain water that God will send. It must have been quite a holy moment because I believe that positive confession went through to every soldier who was going to have to dig into the rock in the heat. I wonder... Are you ready to change your confession uh, to believe that God is going to bring all of us through this crisis? And uh, I'm just going to pray. It's, it, it, it's a time for each and every one of us to sharpen our tools, um, to get back to God, to value His Word, um, to, to, to really become a worshiper um, and the tool of obedience. What is it that God wants to do in this time? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Uh, for your blessing that comes to us through your written word. It is your word. It gives us incredible direction. And at this time, I know that many of us are troubled. We're concerned and anxious. And I pray, God, that you would give us peace. Above all else, Lord, help us to confess your word, to confess the truth. Uh, Lord, to be able to know that um, when we confess the truth, we'll line up our mind and our hearts and that faith will arise. Uh, God, I just pray, forgive us. Lord, if we have wandered away from you, if we just spent our life relying on natural tools without realizing that the future lies in us using the spiritual tools. I wonder if you would pray with me if you need to give your life to God. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me of every sin I've committed. Please Write my name in your heavenly book and I ask you to give me eternal life. And Jesus, please become my leader. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that concludes our service for this Sunday. And we just want to thank you so much for joining us. We hope that it has blessed you, encouraged you, helped you to grow and just help you take your next step in your walk with God. Yo, we just pray that that word would absolutely equip you to take your next step. And if your next step is to, you gave your heart to Jesus or it's your first time with us, then please let us know. Don't take this decision or make the decision by yourself. We would love to celebrate with you. You've become a party starter. And so the way that you can do that, again, just like we did in the first end of the service, at the back end, you can click the connect card and we would love to serve you and pray with you and celebrate with you. Just the best news ever. And we also send you information. You know, what does it mean that I've given my life to God? Our biggest tool in our toolbox is understanding. And when we understand the life change that's happening in us, when we understand what God is doing, we can really grow. So please get hold of us. We will now help you understand the decision that you've made. Yeah, well, myself and Kelly want to say that we pray for you all the time, for all our local Tigers. We love you so, so much. 
love you so close to our hearts and uh, we miss you all but we believe in the best is yet to come don't forget each, each week, week each one reach one, one.